Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Titus, chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. Titus, chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. Beginning in verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Well, what should be clear to this point in our series is that if Paul's letter to Titus is going to shape the way we do church here in Celebration and St. Cloud and uh, all the places that our missional partners are serving, if the New Testament book of Titus is going to be our handbook for the way we're going to do ministry, then sound doctrine has to be really, really important to us. But, and, and here's what we should have picked up so far, sound doctrine in this letter is not limited to just believing all the right things. Sound doctrine is not just correct doctrine. It's doctrine that is transformational. This is really key. Sound doctrine in this letter produces things. It produces godliness. It produces good works. It produces mature faith and real tangible love. Sound doctrine produces healthy homes and families, leaders whose Christian profession is backed up by the way they live their lives. And I say we should have picked this up already because even in the first four verses of the letter, chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, Paul identifies his mission as an apostle as giving his life for the sake of God's elect people specifically that their knowledge of the truth would bring about godliness. That's transformation. Paul says, that's my whole calling as an apostle. And then, 1, verses 5 to 9, Titus should only select elders in every church on the island who hold on tightly to the word of God, but they hold on to it in such a way that their lives are above reproach. So transformed lives among your leaders. The reason this is vitally important, Paul writes in 1, 10 to 16, is that there are so many false teachers who claim to know God, but their lives haven't been transformed. The way that they live exposes their unbelief and lack of intimacy with God, and their, their ministry doesn't flow out of knowing God. They're shysters. But you, Titus, chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, you teach, you speak, keep on speaking to people about sound doctrine, but do it in a way that old men are examples of love and steadfastness, that older women don't have to numb their woundedness with wine, but pour themselves into younger women whose lives then shine with kindness and sustained love for their husbands. And the young men become known for their ability to master their emotions and lusts and their inclination to exploit and dominate others. Remember, Crete was notorious for its treachery and violence and sexual corruption. And young men of sound doctrine, according to this letter, would stand out against this culture, which certainly may attract mockery 
and people who would attack them, but it will also provide real-life examples of a healthy alternative way to be a man. And is it any different today? Nicole Johnson says, here's what I find tremendously disconcerting. Hollywood has started writing and producing content which depicts men as ridiculous and as people who should not be taken seriously. The characterizations of men in the media over the past two decades portray men as weak and incompetent. Clearly, the men creating movies such as Knocked Up, Old School, The 40-Year-Old Virgin, Pineapple Express, Super Bad, The Hangover, Forgetting Sarah Marshall, and I Love You Man are simply seeing dollar signs. What man would ever walk away from these movies saying, I want to be like him? And conversely, what woman would ever walk away from these movies saying, I want to marry a man just like that? But the young men of sound doctrine don't just believe orthodox doctrine. They shine like lights in the darkness. And to finish the list, even those who find themselves enslaved renounce the expected bitterness and corruption for lifestyles that instead radiate the beauty of knowing God. But the emphasis here is on truth that transforms. The emphasis is everywhere in this short letter, but the doctrine is not sound if it's not transforming people and relationships and churches and communities. Our text for today provides a ground, a foundation for this kind of transformed living that Paul's been hitting in every section of the letter. And we know that because the very first word in verse 11 is the word for. And this little connecting word points us back to the first 10 verses of the chapter and explains for us the basis of the transformed people and relationships that Paul is talking about. This is why they live the countercultural lives they are living and why Titus needs to keep on teaching them to live that way. It has to do with two different appearances that Paul mentions in our text. The past appearance of grace and the future appearance of glory. God's grace and glory fuel our godliness here and now. We begin with verses 11 and 12 and the past appearance of grace that influences us now. Verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce godly, ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. That's how we are supposed to live. And of course, the grace of God that has appeared was a person. The appearance of God's grace in Christ Jesus resulted in salvation for all people, for anyone who would trust him, Jew, Gentile, older, younger, men, women, slave or free. Jesus was a Jew. Salvation comes through the Jews. Jesus said to the woman at the well in John 4, 22, but it was to be through the descendants of Abraham, the Jews, that all the peoples of the world would be blessed. The salvation Jesus brings is to be offered to everyone, and it is, we're told here, salvation by grace, received by faith in the one who appeared, Jesus Christ. This is just shorthand for the gospel. Tim Chester writes, verses 1 to 10 describe what the good life looks like. They give it content. But if all you ever do is reiterate those commands to others and to yourself, then they become crushing. 
So if you say, be self-controlled, well, I, I can't. Well, try harder. See, that's not good news. It's not transformative news. Grace does not mean that what we do does not matter. It does not mean that we can live how we choose since God will always forgive us. Paul is quite clear. We need to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. We are to be self-controlled. But notice this in the text, what enables and energizes this life, this saying no to ungodliness, is God's grace. God's grace is our teacher. There will be times when you need to tell people what the good life looks like. And that is what verses 1 to 10 are for. But if you want people to actually live the good life, then do not emphasize the good that they must do for God. Instead, emphasize the good that God has done for them. Remember, the gospel is news. It is good news. We announce what God has done. And then people either reject it or they embrace it. But it is not a self-help plan. But what we see here is that the grace of God that came in the person of Christ is not just for non-believers. It's not just for evangelism. Here, the grace of God that appeared is for Christians. It's for Christians who need to know why they should say no to things that may be appealing to them. In fact, verse 12 says that the grace of God trains us to renounce ungodliness and our worldly passions. It instructs us and even includes the idea of discipline like a good parent would discipline a child. So grace isn't just letting me off the hook when I sin. Grace involves empowerment to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. So the grace of God that appeared in Christ influences how I live here and now. Saying no, of course, is not very appealing to the culture in our day any more than it was on Crete in Titus's day. And we naturally, just by nature, we think that peace and joy and fulfillment only come from saying yes to the things that we desire. Our age has bought into the deception that the more we say yes, the happier we will be, but Christians live by faith. That is, we trust what God says, and when he tells us that certain things that we desire are wrong, that they are contrary to his nature, contrary to holiness, and harmful to us, we believe him. We have seen his grace. We know his grace, and it trains us to die to ourselves and live for him. Now, just to be clear, what is grace? It is the favor of God given to people who don't deserve it. And in fact, given to people who deserve judgment instead. It is God's love shown to people who are unlovely. Or if you want an acronym, this is how I was taught, God's Rescuing and Caring Exertion. G-R-A-C-E. God's Rescuing and Caring Exertion. The key point is that you can't earn it. You can't earn God's favor. It's a free gift. And it is our only hope. Sam Storms, grace ceases to be grace if God is compelled to bestow it in the presence of human merit. Grace ceases to be grace if God is compelled to withdraw it in the presence of human demerit. 
Grace is treating a person without the slightest reference to worthiness whatsoever, but solely according to the infinite goodness and sovereign purpose of God. Now, in all honesty, many of us have a difficult time living this way, depending solely on God's grace through Christ to save us. We, some of us just think, well, that just sounds too easy. Some of us think, well, I, just, I need to contribute something to my salvation. And it's particularly hard for proud people to realize that the only way to be accepted into God's eternal kingdom is by the heavenly welfare system. Admitting that I cannot do it on my own. Admitting that I do not deserve it. But then relying on the perfect righteousness of another. The perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ as my very own. That's how we can be assured we are saved. As Tim Keller is fond of saying, I am more flawed and sinful than I ever dared believe. And yet more loved and accepted than I ever dared hope. And both of these things are true at the same time. More messed up than I ever realized. More loved and accepted than I ever dared hope. See, this is transformational. If I think that I'm accepted by God because I basically am living by His moral standards and I'm doing a pretty good job, at least better than other people, of earning His acceptance, if that's what I'm thinking, if that's functionally how I'm acting, I will not be profoundly transformed in the depths of my being. There will be no tears of joy and stunned amazement as I contemplate my salvation, because I earned it. I deserve it. But when you begin to understand, just begin to understand the depths of God's transforming grace in your life, your own personal unworthiness, and yet the way God so freely pours it out wave after wave after wave on you, when you get a taste of the real thing, it changes you. It changes you on the inside. Why? Because now the starting point in my relationship with God is His grace. And all my obedience flows from His acceptance of me by grace. It all flows from His undeserved favor upon my life. I am accepted Therefore, I obey. And this is so freeing and so empowering, and yet it is contrary to every other religion in the world which teaches, I obey, therefore, I am, an ex I am accepted. So that kind of false view of God, I obey, therefore, I am accepted, that false view will never bring peace, never set you free, never make you dance for joy or weep over the realization of how greatly you are loved. I am completely unworthy and God knows everything about me including my unworthiness and still he accepts me completely forever because of Jesus' blood and righteousness. That is transformational truth. Jerry Bridges uses the word picture of bankruptcy to illustrate the grace that we're talking about. He says the good news of the Bible is that in the spiritual realm there really is total permanent bankruptcy. It doesn't work like commercial bankruptcy. It is much better in two significant ways. Number one, in the business world, the debts of the permanently bankrupt business are never paid in full. The business person, if he is conscientious at all, has a lingering guilt about the debts that he did not pay. And the creditors 
are unhappy about the payments they did not receive. By contrast, the Christian's total debt has been paid by the death of Christ. The law of God and the justice of God have been fully satisfied. The debt of our sins has been marked paid in full. God is satisfied and so are we. That's one way it's different. The second way is this. There is no possibility of ever going into debt again. As Paul said in Colossians 2.13, God forgave us all our sin. All of the sins that I committed that he forgave were future at the time of his appearing. My sins, past, present, and future, all covered by the blood of Christ. If that seems too extravagant to you, Martin Lloyd-Jones said that this is how you know that you are really preaching the New Testament gospel of salvation. Here's how you can tell. Because some people might misunderstand it and misinterpret it to mean that because you are saved by grace alone, it doesn't matter at all what you do. You can go on sinning as much as you like. They'll, they'll misinterpret it that way. And, and Lloyd-Jones says, that's how you know you're preaching the New Testament gospel. Do you think that somehow your failures, even if they are frequent and serious, keep God from loving you? Is that what you think? Brendan Manning states, we cannot assume that he feels about us the way we feel about ourselves. Come to me now, Jesus says. Acknowledge and accept who I want to be for you, a savior of boundless compassion and infinite patience and unbearable forgiveness and love that keeps no score of wrongs. Quit projecting onto me your own feelings about yourself. And at this moment, your life is a bruised reed, and I will not crush it. A smoldering wick, and I will not quench it. You are in a safe place. But Manning confesses, it used to be that I never felt safe with myself unless I was performing flawlessly. But then I came to realize that my desire to live perfectly had transcended my desire for God. Undeserved, unending grace trains us. It frees us, it instructs us, it empowers us to renounce all ungodly living and worldly passions and it trains us instead to say yes to the Holy Spirit fruit of self-control. It trains us to be upright in the way that I relate to others and it trains me to be more and more like God himself, to be godly in this present age because of Christ's appearing as the very grace of God. The second appearing that Paul mentions here is found in verses 13 to 15. The future appearance uses the same word of glory and how it influences us now. Verses 13 to 15. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Titus, declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority and let no one disregard you. So here, Paul demonstrates how the blessed hope that we have of the appearing, the unveiling of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ 
changes the way we live now. Right now, the fullness of His glory is hidden from view, but it will be unveiled one day soon. And in His first coming, we have seen His glory. We beheld His glory in the miracles that He performed. We saw it in His patience and kindness and the way He treated sinners. And we especially saw His glory revealed in the way He voluntarily died and laid down his life. We shall see his glory, whether we're coming out of the grave or still alive when he returns, we shall see him as he really is. And every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He comes to complete, he comes to realize the fullness of the salvation that he secured for us. And as Paul points Titus and us to that appearing of the glory, he reminds us of his purpose in coming in the first place. He came to redeem us from all lawlessness. That is, every kind of sin. And he came to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are now so transformed from the inside out by the saving and sanctifying grace of God in Christ, so changed that they are now zealous for good works, enthusiastic to do good. Why are they now zealous in this way? <clears throat> because they've been redeemed. They have experienced the grace of God in Christ. Because they understand why Christ saved them. Because they know that they don't belong to themselves any longer. They understand their identity now as God's very own possession. They understand what's ahead in the new world to come. And they now, as part of that new creation, are already living as part of that new age. N.T. Wright, Paul's appeal about how people should live is built firmly on his belief that the future has already appeared in the present. And that we are all now summoned to act in accordance with that future. We have glimpsed in Jesus the way things are actually going to be. A new world created and nurtured by God's generous, self-giving love and grace. And so now, we can see how we should live in the present. He is welcome, welcoming us into a way of life for which he has set us free. His own death on our behalf has unlocked the door of ethical possibilities and we are now invited to go through into his new world. The world of genuine purity, the world where we can begin to contribute positively to people and society around us, that, that our lives count. We are zealous now for good because he's completely forgiven us. He has secured our eternal salvation, adopted us into his family, taken all of our sin and guilt and shame upon himself, transferred all of his perfect righteousness to us. And he's done this, that our lives would bear the mark of his ownership, but that our lives would also be lived as he lived, increasingly the way we will be in the new age to come, heaven the new world, the new heaven and the new earth. The past appearing of grace, healing and setting me free and uh, granting me peace now. And the future appearing of glory keeps me anticipating unimaginable joy when I will see my Savior to whom I belong face to face hear his words of acceptance, feel his embrace, and that hope burns in me and changes my attitude, my actions, my words, 
the way I spend my money and the priorities of my life, the way I relate in all of my relationships. It changes me now from the inside out. And it's all related to the gospel. So notice then the connection in this chapter. Titus, here's what I want you to do. Start with the older men, then the older women, pouring into the younger women. Make sure the young men know they're to be self-controlled and the slaves teach them. If they can get their freedom, fine. But if not, don't let them be bitter. Don't let them steal from their masters. Let them instead reflect the kind of love that I show to people who didn't deserve it. Why? For the grace of God has appeared and the glory of God will appear. It's because of the gospel. It's because I am, I am accepted already that I am then empowered to obey and live as God instructs me to live. Well, Martin Luther underscored just how important it was to be clear on the gospel. So here's what he said. I must pay attention to the gospel, which teaches me not what I ought to do, but what Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has done for me. That he suffered and died to deliver me from sin and death. The gospel wills me to receive this and to believe it. And this is the truth of the gospel. And it is also the principal article of all Christian doctrine and godliness. We should know it well. We should teach it to others and beat it into their heads continually. That was Luther's colorful way of saying it. Preaching the gospel to yourself every day as you start your day. I am accepted because of Christ. I am loved forever because of Christ. And there is nothing in this life or the life to come that could ever separate me from that love. I am forgiven forever because of him. I've received his perfect righteousness. I belong entirely to him. Start out every day by preaching the gospel to yourself. Well, the way Paul puts it here in the very last verse of our text, verse 15, Titus Declare these things. Keep talking about these things. Exhort and rebuke when necessary. If people will not accept the gospel of grace, rebuke them. And don't let people just dismiss this teaching because it may be too easy or too difficult or irrelevant. Don't let them disregard you. Insist on the gospel. Guard the gospel. Raise up elders to protect that gospel. And it's my calling and mission as an apostle to see to it that knowledge of the truth produces godliness in the people who embrace it. Would you make this your prayer for our church? That we would be so clear on the gospel, cling so tightly to the gospel, believe the gospel, so that we in turn would order our lives in keeping with the word of God. Our obedience would flow from our acceptance in him. Let's pray. Lord, we never tire of celebrating what you have done on our behalf. And the longer we live and the more in touch we become with our own brokenness and our own tendency to go our own way, the more we marvel at your grace. The more this life disappoints us, the more we long for the day when your glory will be fully revealed. We will behold your glory. We will be instantaneously changed into your likeness because we will see you as you really are. And in the meantime, Lord, I pray that these astounding truths that you have revealed, the appearing of grace in the form of Jesus and the promise of the appearing of your glory one day soon, let them burn in our hearts, let them nurture our faith, let them completely transform the way we live and the way we love each other. Do this, I pray, for the glory of your name, for the advancement of your son's kingdom and for the good of us, your people. Amen.